this will be interesting, not just if you're running DHIS2, right? Um, this is sort of basic infrastructure stuff. You might find it useful for all kinds of other reasons. Um, anyway, hopefully you get a good idea this morning, a good a flavor of what LXD is useful for and what maybe what it's not so useful for, um, how to work with it. Um, incidentally, everything I'm going to do in this session, you can also do on your laptop. There's no requirement to actually do this on a cloud server. You can even do it on, a, on an Oracle VM. The only thing that you can't do on your laptop is to do the SSL stuff around the DHIS2 setup. <laughs> okay, so will I go full screen? I'll go full screen for a little bit, but I don't want to stay full screen because I've got to jump backwards and forwards into my terminal. Most of what we're going to do today is will be will be more of a kind of a demo. I'm going to show you different a couple of different commands, um, but. If you're looking for a good tutorial, that's quite a nice one there um, that you can you can work through as well. It'll cover some of the same stuff I'm doing here. Um, the, if you're looking for the definitive documents with all the all the sort of reference configuration options and things like that, this is the place to go to. Uh, yeah, I say I'm going to do a little bit of a demo. Um, installing LXD. Most of you, if you install Ubuntu 20.04, um, it'll come with a reasonably recent version of LXD installed already. Versions, um, I think the latest version of LXD is 4.1 something, but um, LXD tends to follow the same pattern of Ubuntu. They have an LTS edition, um, which means that it will be supported for the next six years. So it's always best to work with, with LTS editions. And so the, the LTS edition we're using is version four. That's what was installed by default yesterday. You know, when I logged into my Ubuntu machine, that's already there. Um, depending on what distribution you are, or what cloud service, what image you're using, you may not have it installed. It's easy enough to install. You can do it like this. Um, I'm going to have to, whoops, I'm going to have to do it again now because I deliberately uninstalled it on my server um, so that I could get back to a clean situation. So that's how you install LXD. And I don't know, Jaime, if you're on the call, you were asking me some, some months back about Debian. If you have a Debian host, then I understand that the Debian package for the LXD host is not currently available, but the snap works. So on Debian, you could do an apt install snap followed by snap install LXD, just like that. And that should also work on a Debian system. Okay, so we'll tell you a little bit about the network, a little bit about storage. We can talk a lot about storage today because the other big session I have planned this morning is on Postgres device. Um, so get this out of the way of my slide. <laughs> a little bit around creating containers, starting them, stopping them, deleting them, executing commands inside them, and a little bit about configuring limits and security parameters. I mean, that last point is really the, the main point of why we'd use containers at all, right? Otherwise, you could just run your Nginx or your Apache or your Tomcat and your Postgres all just run on the same server. But we want to be able to limit what they can do to prevent them interfering with one another. So configuring limits is, is really the fun thing about having containers. It's also a neat way to, to keep your functionality separate. Um, but yeah, I'm going to demo you this stuff. And I think I've got another. These are some of the useful limits that we would typically put on containers. I'm going to show you all of these. Um, setting memory limits, right? You might have a 64 gig, 64 gig physical server, <coughs> but you don't want your 
Apache to use more than four gigabytes or something like that, right? You can set memory limits on it. CPU allowance is an important one. Um, I should actually do this by default. Um, many of us have been in the situation where a particular application starts to run wild, right? Starts to use 100% of CPU um, to the extent that sometimes it becomes even difficult to log into the machine, right? Because everything is getting slowed down. Um, I find quite a good practice. Take all your containers and make sure none of them are allowed to use more than 95% of CPU. What that means then is if any of them goes a bit crazy and gets into some tight CPU loop, you'll always have 5% of CPU that will be spare. So you'll be able to do your SSH stuff and things like that without being disturbed. You can set harder limits on CPUs. If you know that you've got um, 24 CPUs, for example, on a physical server, you can say, right, my Tomcat is going to use CPUs numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I can set my Postgres to use CPU number 10, 11, and 12. Um, so that's a more a more harder partitioning. Um, security protection, this is an interesting one. I mean, it, it's very easy to create containers, and it's also very easy to delete them again. Um, and sometimes you want to make deleting them a little bit harder, particularly your database container. You know, it's, it's a bit scary that just going LXE delete force Postgres and then your database container will be gone. One of the configuration settings you can set on it is this one, security protection delete. Uh, if you set that and if you try to delete the container, it'll refuse and it will only let you delete the container after you've set security protection delete, it was false again. Um, that's a general problem, I think, with or general risk, I guess, with virtual machines, cloud servers, containers. I mean, they're all they're so easy to make and so easy to destroy. And there have been cases. I know there there's a few from people I know who are actually on this on this in this session where their country system has been deleted off a cloud server. Right? Somebody's accidentally removed the cloud server. Because, I don't know, there was some miscommunication. They thought that a backup had been made and somebody thought that the backup was there back in the country, but nobody had actually verified. And so the server got simply deleted. Um, and afterwards, people found themselves missing six months or two years worth of data. Um, we'll talk a little bit about data loss later today. But yeah, it can be. If you know that your containers are designed to be around for a while, you don't plan to delete them, then you can set security protection on them to make sure you don't accidentally delete them. Security nesting is a cool one. Um, as you saw yesterday, I think, that when you make a container, um, you basically have like a, a full Ubuntu operating system, assuming you use an Ubuntu image running inside the container. And you can do pretty much anything you want with that as if you were running on a real operating system. Um, one of the things you can do is you can run containers from within the container. Um, so you could run an LXD daemon inside a container, which is running on an LXD daemon in the host. Uh, there are some use cases where you want to do that, um, but you need to you need to set the security nesting to be true to allow the container to be able to create nested containers. The big use case we'll look at for that will be if you want to run Docker inside a container, because some Docker's are just containers in the same way that LXE is are containers. They all use the same the same kernel features. Okay, so that's the little bit of, okay, um, I'm kind of telling you here what I'm going to do, and then I'm going to do it. Okay. Up until now, we've been creating full Ubuntu 2004 containers. Um, I've got a typo in there. I've built my, my sort of installation tools around these Ubuntu containers, largely because I know the people are quite a lot of people are quite familiar with Ubuntu, so it's it's not a big conceptual leap to work with Ubuntu running in a container. Um, the truth is they're a bit big, right? You don't need to have such 
such massive Ubuntu containers running just to do simple things. But there are other containers that you could lo load. If you do LXE image list, it'll give you a list of all the Ubuntu containers that are available. One of the nice things about that, it's a very easy way of trying out new versions, old versions, see if your software still works on version 18.04. You can create an 18.04 container and try it out. You want to try out the latest 20, Ubuntu 2010, you can, you can um, similarly launch a uh, Ubuntu 2010 edition. They're not just Ubuntu containers. If you go to the images, it's LXC image list images. Um, in fact, it'll give you the same list that you see from that URL there. You also got access to Debian, Alpine, um, CentOS, uh, various odds and ends. Um, Alpine is an interesting one in the sense that it's really tiny. Uh, Alpine is the distribution that most Docker images are built on. Um, I'll show you how we can make little Alpine images as well. And that's pretty much what we'll run through with the LXC. So it's a good idea, I think, to familiarize yourself as much as possible with, with um, the base environments. Play around with making new containers, see what, play around with the network, so that when you start installing your DHIS, DHIS stuff on top of it, then you're familiar enough with the environment. Right, so let me go backwards and forwards between presentation and terminal then. Let me escape from full screen. I'll try and do this without reading the documents as I go. So what I've done with my server, here's my server here. I actually deleted, I've deleted my LXE, <laughs> I mean my LXD, um, so I need to install it again. If I just do snap install LXD, it's going to install the latest stable version 4.11. I've not tested anything on the latest version 4.11 for production purposes. I usually like to be a bit conservative anyway. Let's stick with the LTS edition. Um, I've got the string back here. It's minus minus channel equals 4.0 stable. Now, if you're working with Ubuntu 20.04, you probably don't ever need to do this. Um, you probably find that LXD is already installed. Um, if it's not, this is the way you'd install it. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed. Okay, now my LXD is installed. Um, LXD is just like a it's a it's a hypervisor daemon that you find is running on the system now. Um, to see what's running. Ah, it actually should be running. <laughs> anyway, maybe it's because it's not initialized. So once you've got LXD installed, you can <coughs> execute these LXE commands. Right? If ever you go, if you go LXE minus help, it gives you some of the options. There's a whole lot of options there. To know about some options, you might go LXE move, for example, help I'll tell you how to move a container from one place to another. Um, two important things that we want to concern ourselves with our LXD environment is the network. And you can see the only network that we're seeing at the moment is just my physical, my, this is my physical um, network interface. It's not managed by LXE. We haven't configured any network yet. Another thing that we're interested in for containers is the storage. This is basically where, where you're going to put the containers if you make containers. And currently, we've got no storage defined. 
All right, so in order to start building up an environment, creating containers, allowing them to interact with one another, we need to make some storage and we need to make a network. Um, sometimes it might make sense to do all of this in advance. If you're really putting together a very customized system, you can start here creating storage areas, creating networks. Um, Generally, the easiest way to get started is exactly the way they suggest there. If this is your first time running. You should run an LXD init, right? right. What LXD init will do, it'll set up some defaults for you um, and it'll create a basic network and it'll create a default storage area. Um, I think when Stephen was taking you through the install yesterday, uh, he was using this script. LXD setup. Now what LXD setup does, okay, here's a ready message, it shouldn't do that. Right? I, better, I better fix this to make sure that LXD setup on a blank machine doesn't install the latest version of LXD. Mental note, come back to that. And the other thing it does, it runs LXD in it, it runs it with um, an option called precede. What we see it is, it's just some pre-configured, some pre-configured um, um, options. So you don't have to answer the questions. Um, the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to actually answer the questions. We go through one at a time. The other thing that happens in this script is it does a couple of kernel tweaks. I can't remember the URL off the top of my mind, but if you Google LXD production settings, It'll show you a couple of kernel tweaks that you should do. I'll show you those in here. For the kernel folks among you, you know, we got sysadmins here. These are a few kernel configuration settings that you should set um, if you're running, um, particularly if you're running a lot of containers. I mean, what we found early on, I remember last year when we did a trading of trainer session and people went away and they started making containers. Everything will work fine until you make 10 or 11 or 12 containers. Somewhere around there, depending on your system, eventually it's gonna start complaining. Usually it complains about too many files being opened, right? Um, so there's certain kernel limits need to be opened up if you want to make lots of containers. And by lots, I mean, you can make lots. You can you can quite conceivably have 100 containers running in a, a reasonable machine, as long as they're not all using vast amounts of CPU and RAM. So we're going to run LXD init to set up LXD for the first time. There's a few few gotchas in here. Um, right, so it's going to start asking me all kinds of questions. Do you want, would you like to use LXD clustering? Well, you know, I would really like to use LXD clustering, but I'm not going to. Um, this is this is a bit like what I was referring to in, in Rwanda yesterday. I mean, Rwanda, they have three different servers at the moment, and all each of them are running LXD. Um, but because it was never planned that way, it just kind of happened. It, it, it sort of grew that way. Um, they're not actually arranged in a cluster. They're just actually three independent machines running LXD. The advantage of clustering them is that you can just treat then all of your three machines as if it's one big LXD machine, <laughs> create containers, move them transparently from one to the other, etc. Uh, we're going to keep our lives a little bit simple and not cluster anything. We do need to make a new storage pool, right? Because as we saw here, we've got no storage defined, right? When I listed, we need to make a new storage pool. The name of the pool we'll make, we call it default. That's default is the default. Now here is the tricky bit. We got to decide what kind of file system backend to use. Um, now, this is a difficult decision for me to make um, for this because ZFS is really the best way to do it, 
right? But I don't want to get, I don't want to encourage people to go off creating systems based on ZFS unless they've done a whole lot of background reading and practice around ZFS file systems. We need to do a whole separate session on, on ZFS itself um, before um, going into here. So the most inefficient way of doing it, but also the simplest, is to use just the directory file system. What this means is it's going to take a directory on your existing file system and it'll put all your containers there. For our kind of setup, where we're not doing a lot of fancy things, particularly snapshots, snapshots are a great feature of containers, um, but snapshots be really slow on the DIR file system because a snapshot literally means you're going to take a copy, a physical copy, right? So a snapshot would take a really long time. If you're doing snapshots on ZFS, those snapshots are nearly are nearly instantaneous, right? Because ZFS uses a copy on write thing. So it's very cheap to make snapshots. Um, I've got a got a link somewhere, I think, in my next presentation to doing doing Postgres. Doing Postgres on ZFS. Now, one of the nice things about it is the ability to snapshot LVM. A lot of people in VMware environments, and VMware is sadly very common, um, will get their will get their storage assigned to them as LVM volumes. It's quite cool to take an LVM volume and tell LXD to use that as a backend. Because LVM also allows some quite nice features around snapshots and the like. But for today, we're going to keep our life simple and stick with DUR. And if you've got a simple enough installation, then keeping it simple won't do you any harm. Okay, we don't want to connect to a mass server. We do want to connect, connect. We do want to create a local network bridge. As you see, we don't have any network defined. So we say yes. Now, this is the bit which is really important that you take the default here and also for the next thing. And this is a limitation in my scripts at the moment, even though they kind of give the impression that you can define whatever network you like. In fact, I've been a bit lazy and some of them have got some hard coded assumption around the network. So if you're going to use my setup scripts, if you're not using my setup scripts, but you're just doing LXD for some other reason, it doesn't matter. If you're going to use my setup scripts, make sure you stick with this default. The name of the bridge is LXD bridge zero. And the IP, IP version four address is... That one with a 24-bit mask on it like that. Okay, so unfortunately, at the moment, you have to use that address. Right? If you use any other address, then some of the scripts are going to fail. Uh, that's because, as I say, um, I'm not introspecting the network properly. I've made a few hard-coded assumptions. We fix that over time. At the moment, use, the, use this as the name of the bridge. That is the name of the network. We do want to net IPv4 traffic on the bridge. We don't have any need to use IPv6 within our bridge. Um, I'm just going to turn it off. Uh, it doesn't do any harm generally to have it there, but don't need it, so turn it off. Do you want my LXD server to be available over the network? Right, the default for this is no. And I guess I mean, that's a security thing. Um, there are some quite cool things you can do if your LXD server is available over the network, um, including publishing your own images. Uh, you can access your LXD server and run these LXC commands from a, a Windows host or from a Mac host. Um, from a security perspective, generally speaking, unless you've got a, a good use case for putting it on the network, leave it off the network. And what it means is that in order to work with it, we have to SSH into the machine and run these LXE commands. The LXD server actually exposes a REST API, so everything that I'm doing here, well, not the setup, but all the LXE commands, 
um, are actually implemented as a REST interface as well. So you can interact with them that way. <laughs> yes, a good idea to keep my stale cache images to be updated. That just... oh, do you want a PC to be printed? Um, the default here is no. Uh, if I type yes, I'll just show you what it does. Um, it'll just take configuration that I just find there and print it out here as a file. Config networks, storage pool, there's my default storage my driver, um, the profile. Um, that PC file, in fact, is the same file here that. That's all I'm doing in this script, right? I'm just taking a, this is a file I generated before, basically all those same answers I just gave. Um, and feeding that PC file directly into the LXD init command. That's the way this script is able to automatically set up LXD, right? Rather than go through the process that I just went through. Okay, it's, a, it's not really necessary to do this. This is just a little demo machine. You know, if I was running a serious machine, it would be a good thing to do. Let's do that manually as well. Set some kernel parameters. What happened? I lost. I did something to my SSH. Oh, I'm still alive here anyway. Um, yeah, we can we can let's run this anyway. Um, I can't remember the, the Linux commands. I need a sudo to do that. To automatically reread this control file. Oh, okay, this is not so easy to do. fine running in the script because the script runs as root. Okay, then, then there is a command I probably should put into the, let's just Google it. Google, Google, Google. Google knows everything. Um, reload this control. How to reload the syscontrol variables? What is it? I know what to release. The command I'm looking for is to reload. Reload settings. Yeah, just that. It just saved me having to reboot. A reload setting. Okay. Okay, there's some other commands in there. Um, this is something I'm, I need to experiment a little bit more. Um, may or may not be necessary. Sometimes people have found, I think Clement has suffered with this over the years, that for some reason the UFW file um, argues a bit with the LXD bridge. Um, and it depends a little bit on the order of things. If you install LXD before you install UFW, or if you install UFW before you install LXD. Um, what I've done here is um, just told our firewall to please don't block traffic on the bridge, right? Let traffic in from the bridge, let traffic out to the bridge. Um, I need to test a little bit more whether how necessary that is. I had to do it over the weekend. I got stuck. I think it's because I was using a later version of LXD. But it doesn't do any harm to be explicit, and this will ensure that your networking works. 
Yeah, so that's all that's involved with the LXD setup. After that, it just runs the create containers command. What I typically do is I don't use that PC thing at all. Um, I always just something wrong with that. Back again. I always just run LXD in it and set it up. Usually because I've got different requirements of how I want my storage pool to be. Um, but after you've run the LXD setup, then you can run create containers. Uh, oh, sorry, if you run the LXD setup, it'll automatically run create containers. If you set up the LXD yourself, which you can do, just be careful with the network, then you don't need to run LXD setup again. You just need to run create containers. Anyway, having done all of that, we should now find that we have a network, right? There's our bridge network. And we have storage, I hope. Uh, we have some storage. There we have some storage there. And you can see the, this is where the stuff actually is, sitting under Vastnap, LXD, blah, 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 blah. Um, once you've got storage and you've got a network, it means you can start making containers. So let's make one. Well, I don't need to type to use sudo to use the LXC command. And that's because I made myself a member of the LXD group, you might remember from yesterday. So usually the first thing people start with is make themselves a new container. So the noise in the background is the postman has just arrived and my dogs don't like him. Okay, we'll just make ourselves a 2004 container. We'll talk a little bit about what kind of operating systems to use, but this is the one we've been using up to now, so let's carry on using it. I'll just call it test. And that's going to make a Ubuntu 2004 20, image called test. I should be able to see it now sitting in there. I should be able to go to it. Notice that it doesn't show the IPv4 address. It's a little bit odd. I think this is a bit of a bug. It has an IPv4 address. It just doesn't always show it with the list until it kind of warms up a bit. Executing a command on a container, this is typically the way you do it, LXC exec and the container name and then the command you want to execute. Um, it's good practice to always put a dash dash before the command. It doesn't matter so much in this case. Okay, that's why it doesn't have an IPv4 address, it's not running. Um, the init command that we did here, what it does, it creates a container, but it doesn't start it, right? And so if you create a container within it, then after you created it, you have to start it. Starting and stopping it. Um, now we should see it running. There we can see it running and it actually has itself an IP address as well. Starting and stopping, fairly intuitive. You just start it or you stop it or you can restart it. I restart, it's already stopped, so I can't restart it. I start it and restart it. I restart these containers quite a lot. You know, sometimes it's just easier. Um, if you wanna restart your database, for example, you can go into the container and restart the service um sometimes it's just quicker to just type restart the whole container containers start and stop and restart pretty quickly um so yeah you'll see that it automatically got itself an ipv4 address um that's actually coming out of a small d small dns server that's running internally on the bridge 
um, and that's going to hand out IPv4 addresses. Uh, obviously, these get handed out a little bit of random. Uh, when you've got long running services, like your proxy and your database and the like, you want to fix the IP addresses on them. Um, and I'll show you how I do that. In fact, let's just stop it. Let's stop our container. I don't remember all these commands off the top of my head, but I can grep it out of there. Um, get the commands in here. Okay, so if I wanted to set my IP address to, if I want this to always be running on a particular IP address, I've got different ways to do it. Probably the best way to do it is to do this. We first of all, um, make sure that our container test the device eat zero which is attached to the bitch and then I can set its IP address from here just do this in my place let's make it one nine two one six eight zero twenty two my container is called test. Now when I start my container up again, it should hopefully get its new IP address. Sometimes it doesn't get it immediately, it depends on the on the, the lease. When the lease has expired. Oh yeah, there we go. So it's possible after this, um, this container will always have that IP address. Once I've once I've configured that Ethernet zero device inside the container, um, it will always get the IP address. Okay, so back to my storage. You can see now my storage driver is saying that it's used by two things. Um, that's odd, we only made one container, but it's used by two. That's because we also downloaded an image, right, as part of creating the container. So the storage is holding, the storage holds the images and also the containers themselves. Okay. Has anybody been putting up any questions in the, in the Slack while I've been talking? If not, I'm going to move along. I have to remember what I'm going to say. So creating containers, starting them, stopping them, and deleting them. Deleting them. Try to delete this is not going to work, right? If, try to, if I try to delete test, it'll say you can't delete it, it's running. So we can either stop it first and then delete it. Well, if I'm really not worried about it, I can just forcibly delete it like that. Now you see it, now you don't. Now, the fact that this is so easy is the thing that I was saying is a bit of a, a, bit of a worry if you had a very valuable, long running Postgres container. So I'm just going to make another one because I killed that one. Let's go back to, okay, let's make a new one. Make it again. Second time we make it is quicker than the first time we made it because we already have the image. Um, if this was a container that I didn't want to delete in a hurry. And let's start it again. We don't even need to start it. There are some config settings, and this is probably config set on test. Uh, let's see now oh, config. Config test. No, let me config. My brain has died on me. Let's check my slide. Let's see config set. Ah, but the. Hmm. Okay. Let 
LXE config set and then the instance and then the uh, LXE. So if I take the test here, I can I should get completion. Which one? Um, Taken my slide, guys. Config set instance limits. Yeah, so it's a test. I want to make security dot protection dot delete equals true. I've spelled protection wrong. Okay, now everything still looks the same. I still have my test container in stock, but if I try to delete it, no, you can't do it, it's protected, right? So I probably should do this more often. It's actually a good idea. If you have containers that are valuable, you know they need to be around, you definitely don't want to delete them by accident. It's a good idea to set security protection delete equals true on it. It won't allow me to delete it now unless I very deliberately, first of all, turn that off. And then I should be able to delete it. Okay. Where are we? Um, so there's some other limit. That's security protection. Delete. That, one, that one is there. We can also set things like limits and allowances and stuff like that. So, for example, I think I got eight, I got sixteen gig on this machine. I got quite a big one. Um, yeah, I got sixteen gig. Um, by default, if I set up ten containers and I get them all running, each of them will see the sixteen gig, right? And sometimes that's not what you want, right? Because then, if one of them is greedy it's going to take the resources and the other ones will be starved. So if you have a greedy container, you might want to limit it. So let's do that. Let's take our test and set limits dot memory equals four gigabytes maximum. What's not found? Galaxy config test. Ah, no, I deleted it. That's why. <laughs> I've created this thing and deleted it so many times now, I forget that it's a make it again. <laughs> okay, we've got him again. Let's. Um, it is limits. Oh, yeah. Set a limit on it. You can always look at the config of a container by going LXE config show. Config show tests. There's our test container, and you can see up here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Right, its limit has been set to four gig. What that means, in fact, if I now start it up again, LXE start test. You can do this while it's running, by the way. But um, I'm not sure what the effects are suddenly changing the memory limit of a running container. I've only done it a few times, haven't crashed anything yet, but I'm not sure if it's advisable. If we go into our test container and we look at the memory that's available in the test container, we should see that it's no longer seeing the 16 gig. Our test container will only see four gig. Right, so it's that way we can constrain the resources on it. You can do similar things with the CPU. Um, we can set, I don't know how many CPUs I have on here. We just say, we just let this one access CPU zero, nothing else. Okay, so how many CPUs do I actually have? Yeah, prop CPU info, this is on the host. This thing has got um, six cores. I've got six cores on my main machine. If I look inside of test, my test machine, oh, okay, it actually sees them all. 
It sees them all, but believe me, it can only use one of them. <laughs> That's the purpose of. Need to verify that, right? I'll, I'll verify and check with you later. Um, usually, I don't restrict the containers to particular CPUs anyway. It's more useful really just to set their allowance, CPU dot allowance. So we can make sure that our container is never able to use more than 40% of the CPU, for example. Um, okay, so that's ways that we can we can restrict a little bit what our what our containers are able to do in terms of gobbling up the resources of the host. Um, the other thing that I do inside all of the containers, this is actually in the in the setup scripts. Um, I actually run see by default, I actually run the UFW firewall inside each container, right? So that each container has got UFW running on it. And that way we set up particular rules for particular containers. Again, it's, well, this is really a security thing. It's about making sure that containers can't interfere with one another. If one of your containers gets hacked, you want to do everything you can to make sure that they can't spread the damage further. Okay, so what else did I have? on my slides, I can see I'm running short on time. We could talk about LXE all day, this limits. I wanted to talk a little bit about images, I think. Yeah. Um, as I said, we've been working up to now with Ubuntu 04 containers. Um, there are, okay, there's a link here, gives you a, here's a list of, um, other images, Alpine, ooh, a lot of Alpine images, Arch Linux, CentOS, Debian, etc. Um, we can set up images of different types. Uh, you can also create your own images. So what we will do, I think I just give some examples in my slides. We follow the slides. Um, back here. Okay. This will list um, is the Ubuntu image repository. Then there's a repository called images, which is more general images. Um, we can list what images are available um, and we can launch instances using different types of, of image. Incidentally, the difference between the init command and the launch command is just got to do with the way the container starts. If you go LXE init, it'll create the container, but as we saw, you then have to go and start it. If you do LXE launch, it does exactly the same thing. It just creates it and then starts it, in case people are confused about those commands. So let's play around a little bit with that for a couple of minutes. Um, LXE image, if I guess go image list like this, It'll just show me the local images, right? These are images that I have in my image store. Okay, and as you can see, the Ubuntu 20.04 image is there. That means if I make Ubuntu 20.04 images, it doesn't have to download uh, containers. It doesn't have to download the image over and over again. But if we want to look at images on remote servers, It'll show me all the images available on Ubuntu. That's why there are too many of them. I can filter those. They have an 1804 image, I wonder. Um, oh yeah, quite a few. There's the 1804 LTS edition, um, different processor types. So if I wanted to try out my tools, I really need to do this and to make sure that they run on 1804. I can actually do that. I can I can launch or init, doesn't really matter which. Um, and I can use 1804, let's call that one test two. All right, this will make me an Ubuntu container running 1804. Um, I can try out the latest and greatest. And the latest and greatest, I guess, is 
twenty point ten. I don't think it's twenty one yet. It'll make me an image based on based on the latest twenty ten. One of the nice things about this is that I know quite a lot of of folk out in the field have got LXD running already on on Ubuntu eighteen zero four. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, and you can still run uh, images based on twenty zero four. Right, so if all my all my tools are built on twenty zero four images, you can still run them on an eighteen zero four host. It shouldn't make any difference at all. Okay, if I now look at my images, you can see I've now got three images cached locally. Right, um, again, once I've once I've used an image, I keep it in the cache. So if I need to make another one, I can do. Okay, you don't have to make Ubuntu images. And Ubuntu images, I mean, to be honest, they're a bit big. If I look at how much is being used on the file system inside um, my test image, I can go, how can I do this? I can go EF minus summary minus H. Okay, let's see. EU, sorry. And you can see this Ubuntu image is using one and a half gigabytes, right, in its root file system. That's quite a lot, really, for what I needed to do some of the time. So um, if you want really small images, there is an Ubuntu minimal image you can get from somewhere. I can't remember offhand. We can look it up. Um, if you want really small ones, uh, Alpine, that, look at the difference of this. Um, at the difference with this if i do let's make an alpine edge image called what do we want to call it oh. okay creating alp okay not launch i'm gonna create it yeah launch Sorry. images Okay, you see how quick that was to retrieve the image. Right, almost, almost instant. Make a make a new one called up two. Again, or is it much much faster? That's just because the the underlying base image is much smaller. Um, so what I probably should do is actually look at cutting down the size of some of the images that that we're using on here. But yeah, you can knock yourself out, have a lot of fun playing around with different distributions. You can you can run Debian, you can run CentOS, um, and the like. Let me just go back to see different images. Yeah, that's pretty much the run through. So what did we do? I showed you. That's where the main documentation is. A little bit of demo showing you about. How to, how to do LXD in it and set up your storage and network, creating containers, some of the useful limits. I've left out something here. This should be config set um, and the name of the container <laughs> like that, then set the limit. Yeah, I'll fix that slide. All of those should be the same. Um, and we showed you a little bit about having different images. Okay, so that's a very, very quick run through of LXD. Um, this is what's underlying um, our DHIS2 container setup. As I say, it's generally useful. You can use it for things other than DHIS2. And obviously, in an hour, we've just very much scratched the surface. There's lots and lots and lots of other aspects. <laughs> particularly around things like the file system, ZFS file system stuff, and things around the clustering and uh, network access to your LXD opens up all kinds of other possibilities that we can't get into now. All right, on that happy note, I think I want to leave it there.